Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 72 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is nutritionist Julie Matthews, and the topic of the show is Nourishing Hope. Julie Matthews is a globally respected nutrition expert, published researcher, accomplished author, and inspirational educator. Her guidance is backed by 16 years of clinical experience and scientific research with complex neurological and physiological needs, particularly autism and related disorders. She has lectured in more than 60 cities across three continents, been on television, radio, newspaper, blogs, podcasts, and more, and published scientifically referenced articles in journals and on websites. Julie's been featured by Price Pottinger, honored by the National Association of Nutrition Professionals, sits on two scientific advisory boards, including the Autism Research Center, and is a contributing author on a breakthrough scientific research study into diet and nutrition to improve autism, published in 2018. Julie is a dynamic speaker who has educated professionals at trainings for integrative medicine for mental health, Autism Research Institute, DAN, Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs, and the MIND International Forum in Australia. During her early nutrition studies in 2001, Julie discovered that food and nutrition influenced the disorder of autism. She committed to investigate the connections, then explain them to parents and clinicians that can make a difference helping children recover. Her final research paper at Bauman College became the basis for her award-winning book, Nourishing Hope for Autism, which won the gold medal for Most Progressive Health Book. It explains why food and nutrition affects the varied systems and biochemical pathways routinely occurring in autism and how to strategically apply a specialized diet to help children heal. And now my interview with Julie Matthews. You are a nutrition expert, a certified nutritional consultant. And while I really believe that food is medicine and nutrition is absolutely critical to health, this is the first podcast that I've done that solely focuses on the topic of nutrition. So I'm really excited to see what I can learn today and what we're going to be able to share with the listeners. So thanks so much for being here today, Julie. Wonderful. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks. I know that you focus a significant portion of your work on supporting children and families that are dealing with autism. What drew you to the world of nutrition first, and then secondly, to the world of autism? Did you have some personal experience that made that connection for you? Great question. Uh, I was drawn to nutrition, oh boy, many years ago because I just really wanted to find a way to help people with their health and really kind of put all the different ideas and healing modalities on the table and realize that for me, I felt like nutrition is, was really the foundation of that healing. And um, so that's kind of why I got excited and started studying it. It turns out in the first year I started studying for school, uh, I started doing a paper on ADHD and why we have all this these uh, childhood conditions today. And that had, must have something to do with, I was at this fair and I just saw kids food that was the worst of the worst. And I thought this has to have something to do with it. So I decided to do my final paper the first year on that topic. And, you know, as the universe would have it, I met a man um, that I interviewed for this who recovered his two children from autism. I was going to interview him on this ADHD paper, but little did I know that um, I actually uh, just, we spent three hours talking about autism, the underlying biochemistry. Uh, this was like 16 years ago. So most people hadn't really heard that much about autism. People had ever barely even heard of a gluten-free diet back then. So when I found out that there was underlying biochemistry and science and diet and all these things to support it, and that children were suffering and that nobody really knew this information, uh, that was just uh, 
that was my mission after that. I just figured someone has to do it and I guess it's going to be me. <laughs> so that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's how I got involved. So um, I don't actually have a child on the spectrum. In fact, I did this for about 10 years before I had my daughter, which I think, um, you know, I learned so many powerful and helpful things and i um, very grateful. Um, so I'm here to serve families, to be the voice for them, to help them as much as I can. And, uh, you know, I love... I love what I do. I can absolutely tell your passion comes through so clearly and so strongly, and I just love it. That's just amazing. Let's talk about the first steps in optimizing our diets and supportive health. So what are the most important things? And I know this is all very individualized and unique, but what would you say are some of the most important things that people need to remove from their diets? Great question. And I think just to sort of set a framework for people, yes, my expertise is in autism. And I spent, you know, this last 16 years studying very intensely the underlying biochemistry of autism. Um, but what I discovered is that autism is, is a chronic disease, uh, like so many of the other ones that you talk about on your show. And that what I learned helped children with autism helped adults with autoimmune issues and adults with digestive issues and, um, you know, infections and all these other things because the underlying factors of most disease are pretty much the same. It's this, it's this, uh, sprinkling of options that some people get some, get more of than others, but it manifests in individual ways, um, for individual people. So yes, it's all individual and unique. And at the same time, in a way, they're all very similar. So what we learn from autism, I have found applies very well to health and healing of people in general. So to answer your more general question, um, what can people eat um, that's nourishing? You know, it to me, it's lots of good um, foods that are the most easily digestible, most nutrient dense, and least likely to cause a reaction for the most people. And what I found that to be are vegetables, lots of non-starchy vegetables, um, some good quality protein, you know, adequate amounts of protein, and some really, really, really good quality fats, and likely more than the average person is doing. Um, I sort of, with my Nourishing Hope food pyramid, sort of flip things upside down, where instead of being heavy in grains, and gluten grains, it's no gluten, very low in grains at all, if people are going to do them, and instead focusing on some of the concepts. And then within that framework, how do we make them most digestible and uh, best for our body? So fermenting them to get good probiotics, um, you know, having some raw, having some juiced, having some, you know, all these different ways, but getting these nutrient-dense, organic healthy foods free of toxins and rich in nutrients and then customized for the individual biochemistry of that person. And that's, that, that's another step down the road, but even just good quality, healthy, organic food that doesn't have additives is a great place to start. It's interesting that you kind of came from researching autism and then recognizing that it all applied to adults with various conditions as well. And my my journey was kind of the opposite, but I started with Lyme disease and mold illness and eventually got really interested in autism, attending autism conferences and realizing that if you can figure out the things that work for kids on the spectrum, that those generally apply beautifully to everyone. And that it actually was a little more complex. And so I think if you can really figure out autism, um, you have solutions that can help move many people's health forward in a good direction. So I absolutely agree. We arrived at the same exact conclusion from two <laughs> opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> totally. Uh, so talk to us a little about gluten and casein and how they actually act like morphine in the body. And then what are some of the symptoms that this can lead to? Sure. So gluten and uh, gluten is the protein in wheat and, and uh, a variety of other grains. And casein is the protein or one of the proteins in dairy. And so gluten and casein or, um, you know, wheat and other gluten-based foods and dairy-based foods can cause a variety of problems for people. They're two of the most common uh, problematic foods. One of the reasons for that is because of this ability for them to mimic opioids in the body. So uh, normally we would consume a protein and there would be this long uh, amino acid 
chains that form these proteins. And when we digest them, we would break them all down into the little tiny individual amino acids. And then we would use those amino acids to build other things we need in our body. What happens though with gluten and dairy is they're difficult to break down and they have this very weak bond at one of their points. So if you don't have the ability to break them down properly for a variety of reasons, um, and you break it into this protein chain, this protein chain when your gut is inflamed and leaky, which is often common, um, especially as it can be a reaction to gluten and casein themselves, then these long protein chains can leak into the bloodstream and they, if you can believe it or not, actually mimic, mimic opioid compounds, opiates, morphine, heroin, those kinds of things, and fit in that exact same opiate receptor and function very similarly to how any other opiate type of a chemical can. So, um, and in autism, we have seen um, gluten and dairy opioid um, uh, pe peptides found in the urine. So we know that they're in higher amounts in people on the spectrum. And we know when we take them out, there's improvements. Some of the things, if you think about what is, what do opiates do? If you're on morphine, uh, constipation, uh, maybe challenge uh, forming your words, maybe irritability when that drug wears off, um, uh, insensitivity to pain, uh, all of these things we see in autism. So yeah, I find the connections very interesting. So, so that essentially means that with gluten and casein that we can become addicted to them and that we can also have symptoms that are similar to withdrawal when we start to remove them, right? Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's talk about the different diets that are out there. There's so many popular diets, the GAPS diet, the SCD diet, paleo, autoimmune paleo, um, a lot of people familiar with ketogenic, and then you've got the ones that maybe aren't quite as familiar to everyone like Feingold and Failsafe and FODMAP and so on. I think more recently, there's a lot of talk about low histamine diets. Mm -hmm. So how do you, as an expert in nutrition, how do you decide which diets may make the most sense for a given person and which of these diets really kind of stand out at this point as the ones that are maybe more commonly applicable to yeah. people that you work with? This really is my expertise, this idea of applying specialized diets to the very individual biochemistry of the person. And this just came out up by um, I guess I just happened to be fortunate to start right at the beginning of this autism biomed understanding. So when I started, there was only the gluten-free and dairy-free diet that people talked about. So I got to see the results of that. Then the specific carbohydrate diet came out. I got to see Elaine Gottschall speak on it. Um, people started using that diet and seeing certain things. Actually, you know what? Before that came out, the fine goal diet was out. And then after that, SED. And then after that, you know, the list goes on and on until you all, every single one that you named, including, I don't know if you mentioned the low oxalate diet, include, you know, about 15 different diets have come into my world after that time. And you know, when people come into your practice, you see a lot. So I'd see someone that said, oh, this diet, whatever it is, whichever you name it, this diet was miraculous for me. This means everybody needs this diet. This is the diet you have to do. This is the end. And if you don't do that diet, that's the only diet that's going to heal you. So you, you know, so there's all this like um, peer pressure and false information out there when a new diet comes forward. And that's because there is some truth to every diet. And depending on if that diet is the right one for you, you become an advocate for that diet. So it can be complicated for parents out there who hear, this is the one you have to do. Then they try it and they don't get the results they want to see, um, or that some, they see negative results. So that was really my um, experience in the, in the world of diet, which was, okay, I see these diets work amazingly well for some people, and I see they work really poorly for others others. Who do they work well for and who do they not and why? So I started digging into the biochemistry of if you don't process phenols and salicylates in a, you know, in a, a fine gold diet, why is that? Well, that's sulfation issues. Okay. Well, a vast majority of kids with autism have sulfation issues. Now the research shows that people with autoimmune issues and IBS issues and depression also have issues with sulfation. So now that diet we were using for hyperactivity is now we can see be used for all sorts of people with this particular underlying biochemical issue. And then sulfation requires transsulfuration and methylation. So now let's talk about those things further upstream. So that's kind of how my uh, learning evolved, which was looking at the common symptoms that are common with certain foods, 
combining that with their underlying biochemistry and what labs say, combining that with history of uh, understanding chronic diseases in that family to try to figure out what is the best diet for that person. That's what I call bioindividual nutrition. So are there, then you mentioned lab testing, are there certain functional medicine type lab tests that guide you in that diet selection? Do you find that there's any really good food sensitivity testing that you use? I know many people will do food sensitivity testing of different types and find oftentimes very little crossover and find yes. that to be confusing as well. So yeah. what are some of the labs that you found the most helpful? Yeah, well, I guess the answer to this is that I use a combination of symptoms and labs and all these other things I mentioned because there aren't labs, like you said, that will tell you exactly, do you have an oxalate issue? Do you have a phenol? There are some that might tell us, there are some actually good ones for oxalates. Um, so maybe that wasn't the best example, but for things like phenols and salicylates, there really aren't. And when you do a food sensitivity panel, it's not, a food sensitivity panel is not gonna identify an oxalate issue and it's not gonna identify a phenol issue and it's not gonna identify a FODMAPS issue. It's only gonna identify an inflammatory issue, an immune system inflammatory problem. So then you have to look at other things like um, oxalic acid levels or um, if you can get an idea of how their sulfation is working by maybe other tests or other things. The challenge is some of these tests uh, require you to take substances to see if you can detoxify them like Tylenol or whatever things that a lot of people don't want to do so um, You know some of the best ways I found is to do the labs We can maybe do some genetic testing get an idea if methylation is low, you know, so I kind of put them all together I look at genetic testing. I look at functional testing I look at sensitivities and gut testing all that kind of stuff combined with a lot on their symptoms so I have gathered a huge kind of database over the years of if you have these three symptoms in this sort of cluster that's going to highly lead me to suspect this one thing over something else um, like fatigue could be a symptom in 400 different things but I can tell you if it's combined with these other three symptoms I am going to be strongly considering this one food reaction over this other one so that's kind of how I do is a little bit of a little bit of everything what has been your experience with the different blood type diets and the, the specific gene-based diets? Do you find those helpful? That's a good question. Um, you know, there's a lot of discrepancy on the blood type diets as to whether they are um, based solidly enough in, um, you know, uh, rounded, repeatable science. Um, interestingly, in my household, they work out identical like perfectly like I'm an O I'm a meat eater my husband's an A he does not eat any meat he does since he's birth and his parents aren't even vegetarian so I do find that there's some interesting things about that I just haven't found in my practice that there was enough consistency that I used that as a primary lead into which diet for me and my family I have found that once I figured out my blood diet type and I figured out which diet I found a lot of consistencies but again not enough that I would that I personally can say from my professional um, uh, you know clinical observation that it's something that I would find repeatable over and over again so I'm just not I'm not totally sure on that one Let's talk a little bit about ketogenic diets. So I've certainly seen children on the spectrum with seizure disorders, for example, that can really benefit from these high fat diets. But then I've also heard a number of people talk about the fact that it may not be an ideal long term diet or maybe adults with certain adrenal issues, for example. What are your thoughts on ketogenic diets and then particularly using it long term? Yeah. I mean, I think that ketogenic diets are kind of maybe a perfect example of the bioindividuality piece or the biochemical individuality. Um, there are some people that are quite unhealthy and doing very poorly um, that thrive on a ketogenic diet because of their biochemistry. They need that. It's a pretty limited diet. It has some, I think, maybe downsides to some other diets, but if you have that biochemistry and the choices, you know, um, serious metabolic issues and oxidative stress and seizures versus some of the downstream effects, you know, the pros might outweigh the cons. Um, so, you know, I do believe the diet has use for some people. I've seen it be very useful for some people. I get a little concerned by its popularity today um, and the quick 
uh, used to jump to it so quickly for people just because I have heard of kids that have really crashed on that diet. Part of the thing is that mitochondrial dysfunction is something that uh, the ketogenic can either be really helpful for or really problematic for, um, you know, and so I've seen, that's where I've seen some people crash and some people do well. And so I feel like, um, I guess it's a diet I would consider, but um, really want to feel like the benefits outweigh some of the negatives. And then in terms of long-term versus short-term, um, I think that's a good point too, because in some cases, sometimes I found with certain diets, we don't necessarily need to do them forever. We just need to heal the underlying thing and then we can go back to a little bit more of a well-rounded diet. Um, and that's my preference for doing things. So my preference for almost any diet is have it be as least restrictive as possible. Um, that's the million dollar question though. How do we know, you know, how do we not restrict it too much but get everything that we need to out of it? And I think that's where, um, that's where the individual part comes in and that's where it can be a little tricky but I think also a, um, uh, an important uh, diet to consider. Yeah, that makes total sense. Where do you sit as a nutritionist on the split of the macronutrients? So in terms of carbs and proteins and fats, any general guidelines? I mean, if we look at healthy fats and healthy proteins, for example, then we've got people that will say, well, you can get too much healthy protein, for mm -hmm. example, that can mm -hmm. cause other problems. So what are your thoughts on the split there? Yeah. Um, again, I'll say yes, everybody's individual, but I like your question. I think it's a fair question to ask. My experience has been uh, to base compared to a, a normal diet, American sort of standard diet, my general recommendations would be most people would be lowering the carbs and increasing the fat. So I tend to like, um, you know, less carbs than the average diet, an adequate amount of protein and higher amounts of fat than people typically use. I mean, I think generally speaking, if people don't have other issues, um, you know, that, of course, now that I say that, I'm thinking, oh, people with oxalate issues and fat malabsorption might really have a problem with that. But um, just generally speaking, I think um, less grains, less carbs, generally speaking, um, um, and higher fats. And then I agree with you. We don't want to have too much protein. We want to have adequate amounts of protein. So that's kind of how I explain it. Now, if you're not eating the standard American diet, how do I put that in some perspective of of um, numbers, that's probably a little bit more tricky. I'm going to, I mean, I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but I would say, you know, if adequate protein is, I don't know, 10 or 15%, then maybe I'd split the carbs up, you know, that 85% of carbs in half or something. I'm just making this up in this very moment just to give people some sort of a numerical thing because it's so hard to give generalized things, um, you know, specific things in it for a generalized audience. So you're saying somewhere potentially around 40% fat, 40% healthy, complex carbs, and then that 15 or 20% in protein. Is that about? Yeah, I'm just throwing that out rather than the standards might 70% carbs and 20% fat. I would bring the fat, maybe it'd be yep, 40, totally 40, 40, 45% fat and bring the carbs down to under 50%, 40, 45. I mean, again, I'm just generalizing, but just to give people numbers, if you know, we want to get a generalized sense of. Yeah, I think a lot of people are still afraid of fats. And I think it, it is so absolutely critical. I mean, I put tablespoons of, you know, chia seeds and, and fats and other things in my morning power shake. And it's, it's really incredibly helpful. So I yes. think it's important to get those good fats as well. Exactly. How important do you feel that things like hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes are in terms of the absorption of the nutrients that we do get in our diet? And then do you ever use bitters for stimulating the digestive process? Well, I think that those things are critical. Um, and a lot of people don't have enough of them for whatever reason that is. Um, and I definitely have used bitters for helping to stimulate the vagus nerve and get that digestive process going. Um, it can be very helpful for some people. It gets a little tricky with herbs with my population because there's so many phenol issues. I have to really look at each herb individually and see if it might cause a reaction on its own. Um, but I have definitely um, done that. Um, lots of digestive enzymes we use a lot. Hydrochloric acid gets just a little trickier with kids um, because if they can't swallow pills and they, they don't necessarily want to be chewing hydrochloric acid tablets. So that one I don't use quite as much um, just for that sort of kid reason. 
Yeah. And that makes sense because I think even with adults, a lot of times they'll tell you to continue to increase it to the point that you feel that warm or burning sensation and then back down. But when some of the kids can't communicate that sensation to you, you, you don't exactly. have that indicator. Exactly. That makes sense. Um, one of my observations has been that when people are really highly reactive to foods, they probably have some degree of intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut. Uh, and, and this doesn't mean that you just fix the leaky gut and you keep eating the foods that in part promoted the leaky gut. But I'm yeah. interested in your thoughts on leaky gut relative to a discussion on optimizing nutrition, optimizing health, and tolerating the foods that we're eating. How important is that? Yeah. I think that leaky gut is very important to understand. We have to reduce the inflammation in the gut and get the gut working better or else nothing from there will cascade and work. And so definitely looking at uh, foods that are adding to that inflammation. If we don't get out the things that are adding to the inflammation, then we can't really heal up the leaky gut. We can't go back to it. And so whether those foods are... Uh, uh, immune system inflammatory reactive foods like the IgGs or other things we might want to talk about, or whether it's oxalates or phenols that are creating that inflammation. Looking at that is really important. The other piece of it is the microbiome, and that um, depending on the health or balance of our microbiome, we may not be able to handle healthy foods that other people can handle, making those foods. Um, foods that are problematic to them. So um, there are a variety of different foods I might look at that create inflammation. And I would also look at the microbiome and its role for like depleting certain nutrients that continue to perpetuate the process and taking out any of those things and balancing the microbiome. The challenge is, and what I hear sometimes is, like, oh, you don't need to do that low oxalate diet, just fix the microbiome. And that's neat in theory, but the microbiome is so dependent on the food that we eat, we can't necessarily just take some probiotics and hope it's going to radically change our microbiome um, if the foods that are coming into it are perpetuating this underlying environment that doesn't allow that good bacteria to grow. So I feel like we need a little bit of both. I completely agree that we need to balance the microbiome and heal the leaky gut. And I find that that means that very often we might need to have at least a short term a dietary protocol or restriction of certain foods that are doing those things that are causing those imbalances to then heal up and balance that underlying thing. And then let's open up the diet. So I think that there's this like, oh, those restrictive diets are too restrictive and let's just come at it from another angle. And I agree, we don't necessarily want to be on those diets forever if we don't have to, but I do think there is a place that we need to relieve the burden so then we can hopefully reintroduce. And so that's where I'm an advocate for different special diets. Um, but one of the thing about special diets is sometimes the diet people that do the diets, they focus really on doing the diet, not healing from doing the diet. And so I've had to come up with, well, how do I figure out how we get them healed so they don't necessarily need to keep doing that strict of a diet anymore. So that's kind of, that's where my head is usually at. And when we talk about microbiome relative to leaky gut, one of the other things that I've observed over the years is there's often fungal overgrowth, parasitic overgrowth, other dysbioses as well as part of that, and that addressing those fungal, parasite, bacterial dysbioses often is also an important part of kind of cleaning up that environment, cleaning up the terrain so that you can then heal leaky gut. And so I'm curious if you find that your clients also need to work on that aspect of microbiome to reduce the dysbiotic organisms. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, then the question becomes though, what's the best way to do that? Is the dysbiotic organism uh, the cause? Or is the underlying terrain and the food that they're getting the cause? And it's sort of the chicken and the egg thing, right? So once again, we do need to balance it and get that stuff out. But is it by killing it? Or is it by fixing the underlying? And I think some of both of that might be needed. It depends what it is. It depends what they're dealing with, how serious the thing is. Um, but I find that sometimes people use a lot of these killing agents, natural or otherwise, but usually otherwise, um, and they kill it, but then it comes back. And so I do think approaching it from both perspectives is important. Yeah, I totally agree. Makes total sense. So inflammation is such a big deal in autism. It's also a big deal in adults with various autoimmune conditions, chronic health challenges, 
how do we adapt our diet to be more anti-inflammatory? And is there a diet where um, the focus is more on reducing inflammation? Oh, great question. And you asked me that question earlier, which diet are there diets I feel are, you know, the best or something? There aren't diets I feel are the best. We can nuance some of this and talk it out more, but I, I think that all these diets, depending on who the person might be good for, maybe the exception to that is probably gluten-free is, I would probably could generally say it's probably good for most everybody. Um, but as far as the other ones, it could be any diet for anyone, depending on what they need. So is there an anti-inflammatory diet? Um, I would say yes and no in that, yes, things that are going to focus on reducing inflammation are really important. Getting enough you know, glutathione produced, getting methylation working, those things. You can do those by getting nutrients in the diet that support those pathways. You can do that by getting some supplements as well. Um, but also a part for me of an anti-inflammatory diet is to take out the inflammation sources for that person. So that's why it's a little bit trickier than for me to say, yes, everybody, because my mind goes to, oh yes, let's get anti-inflammatory foods. Let's get berries and let's get turmeric and the and then I'm then my hat's going off going oh phenol someone's going to be super overloaded with phenols and feel terrible on this diet so um I would say you know generally speaking more minerals more nutrient dense foods less of the inflammatory things less sugar of course um but is you know but as to exactly a a particular anti-inflammatory diet I would say I would say that also is from my uh, experience quite individualized I would agree. That's very fair. Let's talk a little bit about essential fatty acids because they also play a role in reducing inflammation. Yes. So people talk about fish oils, people talk about plant or seed-based oils. What are your thoughts on some of the more effective oils? And that comes back to the fats as well mm -hmm. that we can introduce into our diet to help with reducing inflammation. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's interesting you bring this up because um, I was just part of a study that was published uh, last month or the month before that on using six different dietary interventions to help with the symptoms of autism. And um, the study what had amazing results showed seven point increase in uh, seven point increase in IQ. It showed four and a half times the developmental age improvement in that time. And one of those six treatments was fish oil. Um, another was a healthy GFCF diet and a variety of other nutrients. But the fish oil one I think is interesting for our discussion. The reason it was used is because it's bound, found to be very helpful with autism, very helpful with speech, very helpful reducing inflammation, like you said, very helpful reducing gut inflammation, very helpful with heart disease and inflammation around, you know, that. Um, so many health conditions in so many ways that um, – Fish oil can be really helpful for a lot of conditions, and we know that to be with autism as well. So probably one of, I mean, I love all fats. I love coconut oil and MCT oil, and I like ghee and, you know, all sorts of things. Um, I like animal fats and things like that. But fish oil is one that has some really great research on the anti-inflammatory benefits. Beautiful. So let's talk, I know again, it's very individualized, but what would you say are some of the more nourishing foods for the brain and nervous system in those people dealing with either autism or Lyme disease that also have nervous system impairments from their underlying condition? Are there some, some key things that really just seem to help brain and nervous system function? Ooh, that's a really great question. Uh, I love fats. I mean, I think that our just this last discussion is a great one. It's so important for nourishing the brain so much of our brain is made up of fat, a vast majority of it, that that alone is just really nour nourishing for the nervous system. Um, anything that can kind of help us with methylation so we get the the um, the nerves myelinated properly. Um, so any of those good high folate foods, um, you know, good B12, uh, choline, betaine, uh, you know, those kinds of things, greens and beets and egg yolks and those kinds of things. Um, those can be helpful from that perspective. Uh, anything that just supports the balancing of blood sugar and the adrenals. So in a lot of ways, that's what to avoid, which is too many carbs, too many refined carbs, um, too much sugar, things like that. Um, and then things like eating, um, I don't want to say more frequently because there is a balance. We don't want to graze all the time. But we, you know, we 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 we're just um, eating adequate food with enough fat and protein and fiber in it. These nice solid meals 
So we don't have to be eating all the time. We can sustain that blood sugar. That really helps to nourish the adrenals and the nervous system as well. Um, and then whatever the uh, particular nourishing foods are, um, some people do really well with bone broth. Some people do really well adding some probiotics that can really help with mood, uh, those good bacteria. Um, boy, uh, just a little bit, uh, you know, as many green things as we can get, but I would make the caution there on oxalates. So I'd be careful not to be um, using large amounts of spinach and things or, um, you know, even large amounts of almond flour. That can really just kick up that oxidative stress and inflammation and really affect mitochondrial function. So yes, but a balance. That's why I think a balance is good. Um, a little bit of a lot of different greens. I'm going to come back to oxalates, but since you mentioned almond flour, lots yes. of people use almond milk for their smoothies and their green drinks, which are also yep. probably a source of oxalates. But is almond milk potentially a concern from an oxalate perspective as well? It's not as high. Okay. Um, I think what it is, I think it must be in more in the pulp or in that part. I'd have to look up the numbers exactly, but what I can tell you is that, that almond milk itself isn't that high, whereas almond flour has about 450 milligrams in a, in a quarter cup. So huge amounts of oxalate. I forget what it is for almond milk. It might be like 10 or 17, which still might be high for some people, but the, you know, almond flour could be 10 or 20 times higher. Than that. And that's the trade-off you don't realize. So you reduce the gluten, but then a lot of gluten-free products do have almond flour in them. And so then if you have an oxalate issue, you know, you've still got to look at what are the things that you're replacing one thing with another. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about mast cell activation and histamine a bit. So yeah. mast cell activation syndrome really has come on the radar, at least from my perspective, a lot over the last couple of years. I didn't hear about it quite as much before, though I know in the autism arena with Dr. Theo Haridis and others um, that it has been talked about for a while, but mast cell activation, histamine intolerance, very popular now in the Lyme disease community, the mold illness community. Can you give us some thoughts as to key nutritional considerations that are important to understand when you're dealing with mast cell activation and histamine issues? Yeah, sure. Um, histamines are one of the amines. So in my world, we've been talking about generalized amines like histamine, as well as tyramine, um, those kinds of foods for a long time since the days of maybe fine gold and fail safe and that kind of thing. More recently, like you said, we've learned even more about specifically histamine, which is slightly different than some of the other amines. There's some things they have in common and some things a little different, but um, so some people might address all amines. Some people might be addressing specifically just histamine. Um, you know, I think I think it's really important. Some people have very significant reactions to them. Um, some people will use like DAO enzyme or something to help. Some people will work on methylation because you need a particular enzyme that's a um, that it requires good methylation to have in order to process histamine. Um, and so sometimes we might work on it from that angle. Um, and then sometimes looking at, you know, mast cell, uh, stabilizers and certain things like quercetin or, uh, Dr. Theo Hardy's, uh, product that he developed, the, uh, Neuroprotec and those sorts of things that some people have really wonderful results from. So I definitely think it's something to consider. Um, and I, we see it a lot in autism, but like you said, in other of these conditions where some sort of infection has activated an immune response of this sort of hyperinflammation, um, and that uh, could be due to a lot of different things, and addressing histamine might be important. Now, it's a lot more than just histamine foods, but with histamine, it's kind of like this bucket, and once it overflows, then uh, we have an issue. So anything we can often do to reduce that down, even though the histamine foods might only be a small part of that. But um, histamine intolerance is really inability, in, inability to handle all the histamine that's coming in or that's being, or in the case of muscle activation, that's being activated where this extra histamine is irritating it, for lack of a more scientific mm -hmm. term. <laughs> So it sounds like from your perspective, the, the diet is a small piece, generally speaking, in mast cell activation, that there's many other factors, many triggers. And I think that's consistent with the work of Dr. Theo Haridis and others that, you know, mold exposure in their living environment, for example, is a big one. Parasites can be a big one. Unfortunately, there's so many triggers for mast cell and histamine issues, even electromagnetic fields that we get exposed yes. to so much anymore. Um, 
Let's talk a little about SIBO and, and what people now call CFO, which is small intestinal fungal overgrowth. That one was a, a newer one to me that I just started hearing over the last year or so. I don't remember hearing much about SIBO five years ago, but now it seems like everybody that I talk to or many of them are dealing with SIBO. So what are your thoughts on dietary interactions with SIBO and any thoughts on why this has become such a big issue? Yeah, it's a great one. Uh, you're right. It wasn't really much discussed at all um, years ago. Uh, and I wonder what is going on. I don't think that suddenly everybody's getting SIBO and it didn't exist before. Um, I think it's a combination of things. I think that uh, it's always been there and we're identifying it more. If you listen to the writings of Elaine Gottschall, she's kind of describing SIBO when she's saying that um, you eat carbohydrates if you don't have, uh, if you have too much mucus and inflammation, you can't get the digestive enzymes to the food, and then you can't break the food down. So then the bacteria breaks it down, and then you get more inflammation and more irritation, and then less ability to digest thing, and you create this vicious cycle. If you think about what she was saying, that sounds very much like SIBO to me. She didn't call it SIBO. I don't think it was known as SIBO back then, um, but I do think that might have been part of what this diet's addressing. Um, but then again, now SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There can be bacterial overgrowth in the large intestine. There can be dysbiosis or fungus in either any part of it. So I think that part of the SIBO thing is maybe just more of an awareness of where that imbalance is coming from. And also the thing I think that SIBO's highlighted for us is that not everything is good or bad. Even too much good bacteria in the wrong place can be problematic for somebody. So I think that that is a helpful part of the discussion. Um, what, um, and I think a little bit of everything there is going on. I think we just need to look at the microbiome in general. Um, but I think that if someone has these symptoms, this SIBO might describe the pain and the discomfort they're feeling in a way that just generalized dysbiosis might not, and there might be some valuable things like the low FODMAPs diet, again, to start to relieve that irritation and then heal it so that something a little more balanced can hopefully come into the picture. It's interesting that you mentioned even too much of good bacteria potentially could be involved because I have heard some practitioners suggest that they think the overuse of probiotics with limited numbers of types of organisms could be a contributor to SIBO. I'm wondering, have you come across that idea as well? I have, I have come across, I've heard that. Um, and, and I think that that's possible. Now the question is, why is colonizing there though? Because, you know, we get sometimes trillions of bacteria from fer fermented foods and stuff. And why it is if it is, why would it be uh, populating in the wrong place, so to speak, or um, in proportionally? So I don't know if it's the probiotics that are the cause of it, or if there's some underlying terrain issue or something else that's causing that scenario. And I don't really know that. Um, but I do think that, again, there's like, uh, not everything is black and white. There is this huge gray zone in the middle of, of things. And I think, you know, like in the past, everyone's like, oh my gosh, you must eat dozens of fermented foods. And now it's like, well, you might have a histamine issue. You might not want to do that. Or you might have yeah. a SIBO issue, you know? So again, it's just coming back to, and that's, I think, part of the, the problem with diet dogma that I have is that someone will say, your gut's bothering you, eat more probiotics. And then you do, and you feel worse. And they're like, you're not doing it good enough. You're not doing it hard enough. Do more. And it's like, that dogma is blinding them to the fact that this might be actually causing part of their issue, not helping. So I like to kind of just bring all of those things up as further things to consider. Perfect. Let's talk about, we talked a little bit about oxalates, but let's talk a little more about that topic for people that aren't familiar with it. So I think in the autism arena, oxalates are not an uncommon issue, but I also see a number of adults that do something like the Great Plains Organic Acids Test and show the oxalic acid that potentially also are dealing with some oxalates. So what are oxalates? What are some of the symptoms that they might produce? And then what are some of the key sources of oxalates? Uh, this is one of my... This, along with phenols, this is probably one of my favorite conversations because it's so um, little considered. It's considered so um, not as much as it should be by most of the uh, population. And in fact, 
even in the mainstream medical community, um, oxalates until very recently had only been seen as the cause of kidney stone issues. Mm -hmm. They never saw oxalates doing anything else. If you didn't have kidney stones, you didn't have an oxalate issue. Now we know that that isn't true because um, a study that was done on autism showed they, they did not allow kids with kidney stones or kidney issues into the study. And so nobody in the study had that. And yet they had enormously high levels two and a half to three times higher in the blood and in the pla or in the plasma and in the urine than other neurotypical kids did. Um, so we know that there's issues outside of that. And now we're gaining more and more and more data. If you look at the research that has been done, you actually can paint a really solid picture. So it's not that there isn't research on oxalates. It's that it hasn't trickled down to the mainstream thinking yet. So oxalates are uh, these, um, uh, ions or these compounds that, uh, when they get inside the cell, can damage the mitochondria. And um, the challenge with these, and, and, and when they're bound to calcium, they can create a lot of inflammation. Um, so either way, whether it's they bind to calcium and then you have these sharp kidney stones that create a lot of inflammation and pain, or if you have it floating more freely um, and it's getting into the cell, um, then you start getting mitochondrial potential issues and that can create a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation there as well. So some of the research on oxalates shows you can get um, inflammation, oxidative stress, uh, mitochondrial damage, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, Seizures, there's a study on if you get poisoned by um, oxalate like um, antifreeze or something like that, one of the side effects of being poisoned is you can get seizures. So how does that affect all of these kids that have autism that have seizures? You know, I'm wondering, you know, where is that connection? Is that connection something, you know? So I'm looking at all those things and saying, wow, with this research and what we see, this is a really important topic. There's also more understanding now that the oxalate uh, activates something called the inflammasome, which is this innate part of our immune system that we didn't understand how to, uh, we only discovered the inflammasome, I think like in the last 10 years, and this huge part of the innate immune system. So this to me is a huge level of uh, information on inflammation and the immune system function. And if it can be caused by oxalate, um, this is really important. And so um, the, it can create pain, inflammation. Um, uh, one of my friends uh, and colleagues gets like burning feet, like she's walking on shards of glass or hot coals. Um, uh, I've had friends with um, shoulder pain, hip pain, um, chronic for years, um, uh, fatigue, extreme amounts of fatigue, um, also yeast issues or gut issues. And that brings up the question of, is, is the oxalate, is the yeast bad or is the yeast trying to help? Or, you know, so again, not seeing it all as all or none, but why are these things, you know, uh, happening? Um, and that you could do a low carbohydrate, I've seen this, a low carbohydrate diet for a long time and not address the oxalate or not address the yeast because if it's an oxalate issue, until you address the oxalate, you often can't get to it. So anyway, um, lots of pain. Um, kids that might be eye poking or eye irritation, it's like uh, grains of sand in their eyes. Um, you know, genital irritation, of course. Um, so those, those are some more of the, the symptoms we often see. Um, and they're in things like spinach, like we said. So spinach has about 500 milligrams in a serving. Um, almond flour, like we said, about 450. Uh, Swiss chard, about 250. Um, uh, what else? Um, all sorts of things. Chia seeds, I have to say, are quite high. Um, tahini is quite high. Uh, you know, what else? Uh, beets, uh, even things like sweet potatoes. But now we're going from 500 more down to 100. You know, so it all depends on how much of some of these things people are eating. Like I had clients that would be putting the into putting spinach into their smoothies every day and doing. Um, you know, nine nut muffins a day. And, you know, we're talking thousands of milligrams of oxalate in a day.
Yeah, that's the ironic part is the things that we think we're doing to be healthy. Oftentimes, if you don't understand the oxalate piece, a lot of times it's not the spinach green drinks that are the best thing for particular people. So I think that's uh, important. Exactly. Exactly. And what's interesting is that even um, some of my nutrition colleagues, um, because we didn't learn this, they weren't aware of oxalates. And most of us health people have come to health because we needed to get healthy. So you have these people working on their health and eating all these nutrient-dense foods because they know how healthy nutrient-dense foods are, but they don't know the oxalate piece. So, so many of my incredibly well-fed people have oxalate issues because they had this underlying gut issue or this underlying thing they've been trying to work on. So they're piling on these foods, not always realizing that some of them could be doing more harm than good in a way. So I know looking at the intake of foods that are high in oxalates is important. I know some people will use certain minerals like calcium or magnesium citrate. Some of the probiotics, like I think BSL number three is one that's been talked about in terms of helping to deal with oxalates, Um, dealing with the microbiome in terms of clostridia, for example, also connected with oxalates. Are there other things that you think about from an approach to address someone that's dealing with oxalates? that have been really helpful? Well, you, you've done some good research, so I'm impressed. <laughs> I mean, you really hit a lot of the, the primary ones. Okay. I think um, a key to the this era to sort of bring what you said together a little bit is the point that um, often um, addressing diet is important for oxalate. So part of an oxalate thing is looking at a diet that lowers oxalate. However, that often needs benefits by more things than just that, like calcium and magnesium citrate to bind up some of the extra oxalate that's in the diet, or uh, maybe doing some probiotics that might be either able to colonize certain things or help to break down um, some of that oxalate, Um, things that can help with symptoms of what we call dumping, which is the discomfort that can come with getting the oxalate out of the system. Um, So I see it as like kind of twofold. One is the diet and one is supplementation support. Also, so supplements might come in a couple forms. One, helping to reduce the oxalate that's there. Two, um, replenishing the nutrients that get diminished in the presence of oxalate like glutathione and things. And then three is helping with uh, the symptoms that might be going along with what's going on for them. Those kind of two areas I think are really important when dealing with it. Um, And I think probably a key thing to just mention to people here is that whenever I do this oxalate discussion, there are often people where this really resonates and they run out and they go do the diet. And I want to discourage people from doing that without doing some research first because you don't want to go from a thousand milligrams of oxalate to 50 overnight because that what happens is the body starts dumping the oxalate out of the tissue. It's going, thank goodness. We're free. It's like osmosis almost. Like you're pouring it in, and as you're pouring it in, it's pouring into the tissues. But then when you stop it, then it starts pouring out. And that can be a very uh, uncomfortable and possibly cause some damage and, you know, inflammation and challenges that I, you know, the recommendations in the oxalate community are to go about 5 uh, five to 10% decrease in oxalate each week or so. So it might take some people months to lower their oxalate. So just like to put that little caution out there. That's fantastic. Very, very important. I agree with that. Let's talk a little, there's a lot of talk these days about lectins and some people think avoiding lectins is really important. Some people say, yeah, probably not a big deal. What are your thoughts on where lectins fit into the whole discussion about foods and how they impact our health? Yeah. Gosh, this look, this is, this is, um, I think there's something to it. Um, It's not maybe one of the primary diet interventions I typically use because a lot of the things like the beans and the grains and some of those uh, lectins get taken out when you do grain free or something anyway. So I don't necessarily do too many just like let's do a lectin free diet. But I actually was on a group many years ago started by some moms that was were specifically looking at lectins for autism and found it to be very helpful um certain supplements lectin lock and things like that they were using or um they would ferment their bread using uh i don't know if it was vsl3 some sort of probiotic um looking at how they could break down those lectins because there was a really fascinating study actually i think it was two studies looking at gluten and um, that and then they fermented that gluten 
and it removed the lectins. And when it removed the lectins, it removed the autoimmune reaction from that wheat, wow. which I think is fascinating of how much of this is the wheat versus the lectin. You know, and I don't want to suggest that celiacs just go out and do that because we don't know, you know, but interesting studies to see that lectins were a really important part of what was causing the gluten reaction. So I do like to ferment grains if I'm going to use them, just generally speaking for that. Um, you know, it does it soaking uh, grains and things doesn't take out the lectins. It has to be fermented. So, um, you know, um, so I think some of the, some of the uh, food preparation principles, generally speaking, can have a, a help on those lectins if people are eating them. Um, so I do think there's something to it. Um, and maybe if somebody were digging more down the line and they saw, ooh, I'm reacting to this one and this one and this one, maybe they want to dig a little bit more down that path um, so they can dial in their diet a little more rather than broad brushing, taking more stuff out. And my very basic understanding of lectins is that it's a compound that plants primarily produce as a defense mechanism or a protective mechanism for themselves. But then when we consume it, it's potentially stressful to our systems. Is that correct? Just uh, oxalates and uh, is very similar to that. So yes, okay. um, that's my understanding. So let's talk about bone broth and fermented foods. And we've touched on it a little. I mean, five years ago, bone broth was all the rage. Fermented foods were all the rage. Now there's some potential downsides bone broth particularly with histamine and glutamate. And there's been some articles put out about lead levels if you're not using bones that are organic and grass fed and all of that stuff. So where do you kind of sit at this point on bone broth and fermented foods? I think that they, just like all food, should be in moderation in a healthy diet. I think that they're good foods. Um, I think some people might need to avoid them at least for a period of time because they don't do that well on them. I think other people thrive on them and can do more. But just like everything, I just feel like everything should sort of be a little bit in moderation. So, and I'm not necessarily a fan of the diets where it's like five times a day we're having bone broth, you know, every single day. I mean, if again, if for a period of time it's helping that person, if they're doing part of a diet protocol and it's helping that person, fine if they want to do it. But just like when someone goes into a little bit more of a, a maintenance diet, my personal thing is I think, you know, some of these things we could do like a few times a week. We don't necessarily have to do them every single day. You know, maybe other people will have different theories on that. I guess I just feel like, you know, we find something in, I've just seen this for so long. We find a good diet and then everyone needs to do it forever. We find a good food. Everyone needs to do it forever all the time. And I just think there's a balance in there that, yeah, they're good. And if they work for you, add them. And yeah. Yeah. And, and the challenge with bone broth and fermented foods is for some people, they can be miraculous. And for other people, they can be kryptonite, essentially, right? And so you exactly. kind of have to see how you feel when you're using them. Exactly. Probiotics are kind of another topic. Again, used to be amazing. Take your probiotics. Now we know that some probiotics promote histamine, which is not ideal for people with histamine intolerance or mast cell issues. We know that probiotics don't necessarily, well, they don't come at all close to the diversity or to approximating the diversity of what's actually in our gut. And so even when we take probiotics with two or four or 10 strains, we still could be creating an imbalance by getting too many of that particular thing. So what are your thoughts about the potential health benefits of probiotics at this point? I think I would probably have a similar conversation as I did with the bone broth and the fermented foods, which is that for some people, they really do help. There are um, some soil-based organisms that I used for a couple of my clients, and they were very sick, um, sensitive to EMFs, every supplement, almost every food. They could only eat a few things. And for them, these were life-changing. Mm -hmm. I don't know who's going to be life-changing for and who it's not going to unless someone tries it. And, and so some cases, I think they can be great. Um, other times, like you said, I think that they're just not either that right for the person or that one isn't right for that person. Also, I've seen so many times kids load up a massive amounts of probiotics and then you look at a stool analysis and there's nothing there. After months and months of doing that, and I think that comes back to, well, why not? Is it the terrain? Is it something else? What's going on? So I think that for some people, they have a limited benefit. Some people, they have enormous amounts of benefit and some people they're problematic for just like anything. And so maybe trying them out, you know, if somewhere, if I were going to do a course of antibiotics, I'd probably throw some probiotics in there, you know? Um, 
but depending, I think I would depend on the, you know, just generally speaking, the person, where they were, and what was going to work for them at that point. And I do like the soil-based probiotics. I've seen very positive things with those as well. And then some of the spore-based probiotics that Kieran Krishnan and others have, have really brought to light over the last couple of years have been great as well. Mm -hmm. um, in some very sensitive people, uh, they may eventually find that they have these phenolic or phenol and salicylate sensitivities. And so I don't know that many of our listeners will know much about those unless they've been through it themselves. And so what are phenols and salicylates? Where might we encounter them in our diet or in our world? And what kinds of symptoms might we experience? Yeah. If you have a, um, a child with hyperactivity, uh, this is one of the biggest tips I've come across, which is this topic of phenols and salicylates. So these are, uh, just like you were saying with like the lectins or the oxalates, they're compounds created by plants that help to kind of be a natural bug repellent or, you know, kind of keep them, you know, safe in nature against other, other things. Um, the, uh, we need to, the toxic, we, they, they come very high in high phenolic foods. Polyphenols are some of these phenolic compounds. Salicylates and phenols are in things like apples and grapes and berries and um, turmeric and herbs and cinnamon and spices and um, lots of different types of plant foods, uh, mint, things like that. Um, when you can't, they have to be processed through sulfation. Um, and that was work that uh, Rosemary Waring really looked at was the kids with autism and their sulfation issues. And like I said before, you need the transsulfuration and the methylation working. So for people that maybe have methylation issues or know they've got something biochemically not quite working well, or they have a personal history or a family history of um, a variety of things I'll talk about next, um, they might want to really think about this. And what I, the classic things I think of, if I have a child with ADHD or autism that comes into my office and their parent says that they have red cheeks, red ears, hyperactivity, maybe they have trouble sleeping at night, maybe they have irritability, maybe they have aggression. I have these huge alarm bells of phenols going off. Then I look at their diet and I find out it's filled with ketchup and berries and apple juice and now they are screaming uh, my alarm bells and because I now have common symptoms with foods in the diet um, and they you know I've seen time and time again um, this as a phenol reaction so if someone had that I would look at their diet look at those things and see if they thought that that was going on now it doesn't only have to be children um, adults can have this, but adults, it might look different because we can self-regulate better. So it might be a lot of irritability or anger or something that we can't really figure out or um, sleeping issues, having trouble falling asleep at night, just feeling scattered. Um, the other one that's really sort of unique is um, incontinence issues. So bedwetting or just this in adults, it might just be uh, urgency to urinate right, right away. Um, so I, you know, those are some things that to me, um, because especially with summertime coming, there's so many fruits, uh, that are high in phenols that, um, I just like to point it out to people. I had one boy, he had, uh, he was about 10. He had quite severe aggression. It would come on multiple times throughout the day, um, at, out of the blue, just out of nowhere, he would strike a caregiver or a teacher or a therapist or something. And his mom was getting really worried. I mean, you know, when you're the bigger your kid gets, the more scary this behavior is. And so we looked at the diet and she had already identified some salicylates. So she had already taken those out. And I said, well, you know what? You've got these few last big salicylates in here. And this really seems to me like something I've seen before with salicylates, you know, try, try taking those out and see what happens. And then I talked to her a month later, no episodes of aggression. One, one in a whole month that she said, I think I could pinpoint that to a food that he had eaten. So if you can imagine something so uh, in a life um, affecting their quality of life for everybody, that could be remedied so easily by a food if that's what was going on. This is what really excites me about the phenol and salicylate conversation. 
And my understanding is that phenols are also potential issues in many of the herbal supplements and things that people are taking, right? So we think we're taking something that's good, but because of the phenolic content, it potentially could be also contributing to some of the issues you just discussed. Absolutely. That's why when we were talking earlier and we're talking about bitters and things, I always look at every herb individually to see if I can figure out if it's phenolic because while it might be helpful on these certain ways, if you have a phenol issue, you it could just create total havoc for you. And it can take sometimes three to five days for the reaction from that to go away. And are there ways to test for phenolic or salicylate sensitivities or any tools that can help beyond avoiding those things? This is trickier. Um, identifying if you have it through a lab test there really isn't one, um, which is why I use the combination of symptoms and what I might know about labs and what I might know about the functioning of the pathways. Like we know some things about methylation and stuff like that. Um, but there isn't going to be a test that says, here's your, you know, th these are the 10 phenol intolerant foods you have. Typically not. There are some people out there, there are some labs that claim to have some phenol markers. They might have some truth to them, but in the end, I find that the best way is to just figure it out and try reducing them in the diet, see what happens. Very good. And let's talk about food sensitivities then in terms of food desensitization. Do you ever use things like low dose allergen therapy or sublingual immunotherapy or NAET or Bioset, anything in that realm that you found mm -hmm. can really help people to tolerate their foods across the board a bit better? Yeah, I don't personally do any of those therapies, but I have clients that do do those therapies with other practitioners. Um, and I feel like it's like anything else. For some of them, it really makes a huge difference and it's been very helpful. Um, I've had people use, I think, almost every one of those things that you've mentioned. Um, and sometimes, like I said, they're really super helpful. Sometimes they don't do anything. Um, you know, depending on what it is for which person, I think it's, you know, people might want to try certain things. Um, I tend to like to get to the underlying biochemistry or what's under there, do my best to fix it up so they can go back to eating them. Um, but I do think there is something to, you know, when that part of my process where I'm going to do a diet to relieve the burden. If you can relieve part of the burden by using something that can help reduce the sensitivity to it, great. And if that works for you, that's wonderful. Um, so I think that that's a possibility. I don't personally haven't gone and said, ah, when you have this sensitivity, you want to do this therapy. You know, I haven't necessarily done that to that level. So you talked a little about the study and um, that just came out this year. You talked about the seven point rise in IQ. You touched on the fact that there was a multivitamin, mineral, essential fatty acid supplement, dietary interventions. I wanted to touch a little bit on the sulfate piece. So mm -hmm. it sounds like in autism that low sulfate is a potential issue and that this can be an, uh, an issue where people need a way to raise their level of sulfate. So how do we increase our levels of sulfate and and then do some people need to uh, potentially incorporate things like molybdenum if they are reactive to sulfur compounds? Okay. Um, this was one of the conversations that I had with that, the man that introduced me to this whole topic many years ago, as we spent a lot of time on this concept of sulfation. Um, it is, uh, so sulfation, for people that don't know, it uses sulfate or sulfur, um, and it does... Uh, the body uses sulfate in, I would probably guess, hundreds of different ways. I meant, um, it sulfates the line, the um, what we call the GAGs, the, glu the uh, glucosaminoglycan, um, the gut wall, the brain barrier, uh, kicks off digestion, uh, helps with the brain. Um, so many things require proper sulfation, and so many chronic conditions uh, involve sulfation deficits. So one of the things to do is to increase the level of sulfate. Um, some people seem to dump sulfate. I have theories why that is. Um, and that is tends to be true with autism. So if you look at in the urine, you might see really high levels of sulfate, yet they're not, they don't have it in the body because the kidneys are dumping it. Um, so how to build up those supplies of sulfate? Um, 
I find Epsom salt baths, which was what was used in this. Actually, the study used two things. There was sulfate in the form of MSM in the multivitamin mineral formula, and there was sulfate in the Epsom salt baths that they did. Um, I tend to like Epsom salt baths. I use them a vast majority of the time because uh, some people that take it orally really have reactions. And um, so I've just found that I don't see the reactions typically when I'm doing it through a bath. Uh, so that's my preferred way. Um, some people might say that there's a little bit better increase in levels if you do it orally, but I just have found that the pros of the transdermal, the bath, just seems to work better for uh, people I've worked with. So it sounds like we all just need to go to the float tank for the afternoon. And, there you and go. those are what, like a thousand pounds of magnesium in those as well. <laughs> I mean, that's like the, the ultimate Epsom salt bath. <laughs> So right. for, for people that are really looking for high quality, nutritionally dense food, but have busy lives, working, trying to take care of their kids, whether they're on the spectrum or not, just lots of stress, are there food services or other ideas that you have for how people can access high quality food with the busy lives that many of us lead? Sure. Um, let me let me do one last touch on the um, the sulfate bath thing. By the way, for people, um, yeah, wouldn't it be nice if we could all just go float around in a pool and have therapy at the same time, <laughs> um, nutritional therapy? Um, not that much is needed. So for people, you, you know, in the study, they did two cups of uh, mag of Epsom salt with one cup of baking soda to help with the absorption. And that did quite well. And parents really liked it. It was one of the therapies they wanted to continue, be, I think because it was so easy and it was probably relaxing and helpful for their child. So it's a nice, easy thing that anybody can try. Um, so um, in terms of other things people can do to make their diet journey um, supported, I mean, I think everything from joining some parent groups to get ideas um, you know, sometimes it's more of a matter of even just services. It's just like getting um, ideas of what to do, being creative about that kind of thing, I think can go a long way. Um, there are tons of great, you know, bakeries that will do allergen free things for a birthday party or something. And that can be really nice because you don't need that every day and you might just need a treat and you might not want to do it yourself. That's easy. Um, there's more and more of these things these days. And one of the nice things about diets like the paleo diet, for example, is that it's already free of gluten. It's already free of dairy. It's free of grains. It's lots of vegetables. It's easy. So there's a lot of services out there that will do things like gluten-free meals or paleo meals or other things like that, that somebody could um, do if they wanted that support. Um, I talk about doing things if they want to do them themselves, batching meals, do big meals and freeze things. Sometimes what I used to do with one of my friends is I would cook like, I would make the sauerkraut and she would make the bone broth or whatever. We'd split it 50, 50 or, um, so I think a lot of ways, a lot of things, I'm trying to think if there's something specific. Um, no, those are great. Those yeah. are great ideas. So I know we're down to the last few minutes here before you need to get on to another appointment. So um, do you work with clients one-on-one -on -one if people want to reach out to you? Is that an option? I do work one-on-one -on -one with people and people can certainly reach out. Um, I only take limited clients right now because I am also um, doing many other things. And one of the things I'm doing is I have a practitioner training program where I teach practitioners how to use what I do. So they can come to me and if I can't help them, I can uh, put them in touch with other practitioners that are learning um, what I'm teaching about how to do all this. And for practitioners that are listening, how do they learn more about your practitioner training program? Yeah, the practitioner training is at bioindividualnutrition.com. Okay, beautiful. Yep. What does Julie Matthews' daily nutritional routine look like? What do you eat? <gasps> what do I eat? Um, I'm sort of an, you know, I'm kind of an 80-20 paleo gal, I guess. I like to, I do no gluten. Um, I do do, I do handle a little dairy. So for me, I do a little dairy. Um, I find that my blood sugar is not the best. So a little bit of dairy can sort of help. And the benefit for me is, um, outweighs getting crashing. Um, if I'm stuck, you know, and, and I'm busy or something, um, lots of vegetables, uh, good quality, uh, grass fed protein, um, raw, I do raw dairy. Um, what else do I do? Um, that's, that's pretty much what my diet looks like. You know, I try to keep it well-rounded. So besides your diet, what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Ooh, I do lots of things. I'm so glad you asked that. Nobody ever asked me that. 
Um, I love doing Pilates, which is interesting because people think, oh, that's just for like exercise. But I actually have this, I don't know if it's some sort of a, I don't know what it is. I was having this um, pain in my midsection. I wasn't sure what it was related to. And that uh, physical pain went away with Pilates. So I feel like, you know, instead of needing anti-inflammatory this or that, like I find that that's really helpful. I do acupuncture on a regular basis. Um, I, uh, oh, I do a lot of joy flow related things. So I do fire dancing and I do taiko drumming and I do uh, roller skating. So every week I do that several times a week. I feel like that's probably the best thing I do for my health is get joy um, through exert through physical movement. Um, and that's my meditation too. I'm not so great. I would like to be more mindful in a sort of standard meditation way, but it just doesn't really work so well with my type. So I do more body centered um, meditation in the form of flow dancing and stuff. And that really works great for me. Um, so I would say that those are some of the, the key things. Yeah, that those, I- are, those are great ones. And ones that people in 72 shows have not mentioned before. <laughs> <laughs> so you, That's awesome. <laughs> this has been super, super informative. I think lots of people are going to learn from listening to the show today. I love your energy, your passion, your excitement. I mean, you've been doing this work for years and you can tell that you still just really love helping people and doing it with nutrition as a foundation. Um, I just appreciated your energy, the conversation, the chance to talk with you. And so thank you so, so much for spending time with us today. And I look forward to talking with you again. Absolutely. I totally, I think it was wonderful. I mean, you're more educated than most people. It's a joy to uh, be be on an interview. And if people are interested, I am doing an autism summit. Can I mention that? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Great. So, um, uh, nourishinghopesummit.com is where we're, um, people can sign up for the summit. We're going to be doing it in July. We have um, the person doing the oxalate and flamasome talk and all sorts of things that we've talked about today. Um, and um, if they just want um, more information in general, there's all sorts of like articles and recipes and free things on my nourishinghope.com website for anybody that just wants some support around autism. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Julie. I really enjoyed it and talk with you soon. Me too. Bye. Bye-bye. To learn more about today's guests, visit nourishinghope.com. That's nourishinghope.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com. 